Hello, forensic accountants. This is our review of chapter four. We're going to be talking about a little bit of theory. Which test should we be running? How do we measure whether a data set conforms to Bentford's law? We'll talk about uh, the health south example, and we'll talk about actually running the tests in Microsoft Excel. So, conformity and the likelihood of errors. This is our um, practical hypothesis. There is no material misstatement, and we can say that this is, loosely speaking, what we believe to be true. This is a st statistical null hypothesis. The journal entries conform to Benford's law. If you are a bit rusty on the null hypothesis and hypotheses in general, this is Wikipedia null hypothesis. Under this section, basic definitions, they do a nice uh, job of explaining it in uh, reasonably easy to understand terms. Now, when we move on, this is what we would like. We would actually like the top left or the bottom right. Um, if the financial statements are misstated, we would like to not have accepted the null hypothesis and we would like to have picked up that the data did not follow Benford's law. If the financial statements are fairly stated, we would like the data to follow Benford's law. So, what we would like is if the data conforms to Benford, this implies that there is no material misstatement. And that means the top left or the bottom right. However, the data might not conform, and we have some very valid reasons for that to be true. Number one, the data was not expected to conform to Benford's law. For example, payroll numbers. Uh, payroll numbers are tightly clustered. Most people working for a hotel chain will earn about the same every two weeks. And so those numbers are too clustered for Benford's law to work. Some feature of the data unrelated to fraud, and in general, this could be something like uh, Federal Express having a certain um, service, uh, maybe an overnight delivery of a letter, and uh, because they charge, let's say, $11.95 for this, and they do it so often that uh, this is a feature of the data, this eleven ninety five will come through so often, um, and it will distort the digit patterns, but it has nothing to do with fraud. It just ha has to do with the fact that they have one service that is very popular. The third one usually conforms to Benford, but this is uh, not representative of the norm. Eh, we can just say maybe. And here we go. Fourth, the data was in fact fraudulent. This is where Benford pays off. So the data does not conform to Benford and it is fraudulent. This is where we hit the jackpot. Now, which test should we run? Should we run the first digit test or the first two digit test? These are our options. This is the book. The first digit test would look something like this. And what I do on page 108 is I introduce some reasonably serious errors into the data. And you know, it still conforms. So the problem here is the first digit test is a blunt test. We can, in fact, increase a number such as 100,000 all the way up to 199,000 and it'll still have a first digit one and we wouldn't have changed the first digit at all. Some people are pretty good at inventing numbers and uh, in this case I'm talking about the accounting textbooks. Uh, large audit samples. Now, we start moving on to measuring conformity. The Z statistic. What the Z statistic will do, it will tell us which of these first two digit combinations is the most extreme, which is the highest deviation from Benford's law, and it takes into account the difference between the Benford and the actual, and also the ratio of the difference to the actual. So this amount of a difference here, it's more than twice as big. Uh, this will take this much more serious then probably an equal size difference over here because the expected is pretty large. So the Z statistic, we would primarily use it to, uh, I lost it there, to indicate to us which first two digit combination is the most extreme, the second most extreme, the third most extreme, and the like. 
This test is used to measure all the digits as a whole. Does the whole graph conform or does the whole graph not conform? The problem here is we have this excess power problem. If our data set is large, it will almost always say it does not conform. I like this test. It's the mean absolute deviation. So this is the deviation, the amount above. There's a deviation. There's a deviation. We have two deviations here. But over here, we have three that are pretty much on the money. So the deviations are small. What the mean absolute deviation does, it takes all these deviations, whether it's under or over, it uses the absolute value, and it takes gets the average. So the average deviation from Benford's law, the bigger the deviation, the worse the graph. So this is how we calculate it. And then we have a table. And this is based on uh, years of experience. And basically I say, if the mean absolute deviation is in this range, it is close conformity. In that range, acceptable conformity, and so on. We have different ranges for the different tests. So, this is again the largest Z statistic. IDEA does a good job of pointing this out in their software. Health South. So, what I would use is I would use the mean absolute deviation to test whether the data set as a whole follows Benford's law. And I would use the Z statistics to test which of these differences is the most extreme. The health south fraud. Let's go to another uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation over here. Weston Smith talked about the fraud. He was, he was the chief financial officer when it all started and he was part of the um, part of it. So this is Weston Smith, this is me, and this is Minneapolis maybe uh, four years ago. This is Weston in action. And what he wrote, writes is that they knew that the auditors only looked at transactions that were $5,000 and higher. What they did was they posted 126,000 fraudulent journal entries posted quarterly. So this works out to about a half a million journal entries per year, but they're all under 5,000. And what I did was I made an assumption and I said, I took a real journal entry data set. And what I did was I added transactions going from 2,000 to 5,000. And I said anything under 2,000 would be sort of too small to be bothered with. Uh, I'm going to assume all the numbers were from 2,000 to 5,000. Well, I added some, and you can see that we have sort of a little bulge over here, and we're a little short there. I added more. It becomes more obvious. And I added more, and it becomes more obvious still. So, if the fraud is carried out in that way, Benford's Law would do a great job in detecting it. The other thing is, uh, the subsidiary ledgers. Uh, Health South overstated their assets by approximately 2.7 billion. They overstated their cash by 370 million. This is the balance sheet. They overstated their cash by 370 million. The cash reported was 389 million. That's quite amazing. They only had 19 million dollars in cash and it was uh, reported as being 389 million. They overstated it by 370 million. And basically, I think if we ran Benford's law on the individual bank account numbers, um, and indeed they had some 2,600 bank accounts. Here we go. I have this example in the book as well. They had about 2,600 bank accounts. If we ran those balances against Benford's law, since most of it was fake, uh, this would be one area where Benford uh, could pay off rather handsomely. Just by the way, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper has Halo for journals, and I do talk about it in the book. And we can go here, they have a journal entry dashboard. It's actually very impressive. And let me go, don't mean to make you dizzy, but here we go. Benford's Law is one of their 
journal entry tests. Now, this website I refer to in the book three times and it's gone dead. They've actually dismantled it and they have a YouTube video instead. However, watch this. There is something called the Wayback Machine. And if you put in a URL, you can browse the history of that website going back years and years and years. So I used the Wayback Machine. I entered halo.pwc.com and up came the way that this uh, website looked like in um, the middle of 2019. So this is a way you can get to see what something looked like in the past, at least on the internet. We can prepare the Benford graph in Excel rather easily. I have a YouTube video and it's just pop over there quickly. Looks like this. This is the title. I think I'm going to change this to the word second. Um, and Benford's Law Discussion, Free Excel Software. And starting on round about minute number 15, I start talking about uh, using this. There we go, the Excel software. So you can get the free software. You can have another Benford's Law Discussion. And uh, it looks like this has been reasonably well received. So, summary. A data set might not conform to Benford's law, and it doesn't always imply fraud. I like the mean absolute deviation test, and Benford's law should work quite well on journal entries or what we might call subsidiary ledger accounts. And uh, that's our review for chapter four.